hope you got your candle. Did everyone just quick hand? Does everyone, how many people have candles? Quite a few. Great. <laughs> so we're going to continue talking about the Buddha and what he taught and how he lived his life and how that can help us to live our lives. But the fact that you're actually on this course means you're interested in Buddhist teachings. Um, and it's interesting for you to reflect on that. What has brought you to the Buddhist teaching? And how does it help you in your life? Maybe you're at the stage where you're just curious and you're exploring, which is a great stage to be at. So let's just look at the Buddha before he became the Buddha or transformed into the Buddha or things dropped away and he accessed the transcendental and became Buddha. He was Siddhartha, lived in a palace, had everything materially that he needed. His father was a chieftain. But that ill-fitting chariot wheel that Ruja Muni mentioned earlier on was present in his experience. And he was kept, kept closeted away so that he wouldn't see pain or suffering. But eventually, he got outside and he saw sickness, old age, death. To be born as a human being, any sentient being, is to have an experience of pain. So it took, it set, it took him to reflect and then he saw a wandering, spiritual practitioner uh, who at that time in India, there was quite a lot of people searching for meaning, the meaning of existence. And Siddhartha joined that search and it took him to great teachers and he mastered all the spiritual practices, the great yogi practices. And he went on to the next one he left all his beautiful princely clothes behind him in a simple, simple garment and just walked in his feet. He left all the materialism behind and he was just searching for meaning. And after going to all the teacher, teachers and he reached the highest level that any student had had reached, he moved on because he went, no, that's not it. And I'm sure we've all had an experience of doing something where you think, oh, this would be brilliant and I feel great with this, but it's just not it. And you move on to something else. So he moved on and eventually him and a group of friends got involved in asceticism which is really torturing the body. And he got to a stage where he wasn't hardly eating. He was hardly alive. And then he had a moment of a memory of when he was a child sitting under a tree. His father was plowing the land. And he had this self memory of contentment. I've just been content, feeling happy and well. And he dropped those ascetic practices and he went, that's not it. And then he went to sit under the tree, the Bodhi tree. And he vowed that he was going to sit there until he, he had reached a realization. So what's important about all of this is that he followed a path. 
he didn't start off Siddhartha and then was Buddha. <laughs> you know, he followed a path to get to where he was getting to. And he sat under some, say, for six weeks, six days, whatever it is. And he went and met the dark forces of the mind. And he sat through it all. And then poetically, it was like everything bounced off him because he had done a lot of practice. And eventually, the Buddha emerged. So how do we explain what a Buddha is? Hard to, because I'm not one, so we have to have the experience. So, but we do know that he was kind, he radiated with light, he was involved with his friends who became his disciples and lived a life of being kind, generous, open, connecting, and showed them that there was a way to live without me and you, this and that, duality. That there was a way not to be so connected to the sense of disconnect between looking at you and me sitting here. There was a way to transcend that and it required a path. And in that, uh, that, that transformation that came with the path, he used many ways to describe his teachings. So initially, he, he looked out at a lake and saw human beings as lotuses. Lotus is a flower in India, it just opens wide, it comes from under the water and rises up. And he saw that some lotus flowers were deep in the mud. They weren't out at all. Others were just inching their way up through the mud. Others were half up in the water and others were completely open. And he saw that as a comparison for human beings. Oh, some people are just lost. Others are starting to search for answers. Others, yeah, are connected to some spiritual teachings, a path. And others are completely free and become Buddha. So in that comparison, those images, it's a, a poetic way of looking at what a Buddhist path is. Um, so in this course, the title is The Taste of Freedom. So as the Buddha went on, he had many disciples. So he gave a talk one night, surrounded by thousands of disciples who often sat at night time and listened to a teaching from the Buddha or meditated, just being in the presence of this radiant being must have been just amazing. And he sat outside giving this teaching and he said, just as the ocean has one taste, the taste of salt. My teachings have one taste, the taste of freedom. And he then went on to make a comparison between the ocean and the teachings, the Dharma, the truth. And there are other words used um, to describe all of this, which are in the text that you can look at. So the first point he made, it was around 
the great ocean slides down, moves gradually little by little. The path of my teachings is gradual. The spiritual path is gradual. His own path was gradual. His path is a path of regular steps. So what does that mean for us? It can mean that we have some experience in our life that brings us to look for another way of living. We do some courses. We make friends in this new community, maybe, in Three Rotten in this community. The friends we make are as spiritual friends are a bit different to our other friends in that they're interested in the same thing that we, we might be interested in. They're also maybe practicing kindness and generosity, ethics, truthful communication, mindfulness, simplicity, and contentment. And we become attracted to that way. We study, we meditate. We go on retreats. So it's a gradual path of curiosity. Uh, yeah, curiosity. That was my own experience of, oh, this is interesting. Um, yeah, I want to go more. I want to go on more retreats. Oh, there's a way to work with other people who are Buddhists in the Tree Rathman tradition in Cambridge. I'd like to do that. Unfortunately, I was able to do that. More retreats. Oh, I'm interested in joining th this order of going deeper. But ultimately, I'm interested in becoming an awakened human being. The Buddha. So in order to do that, which might take many lifetimes, endless lifetimes, or potentially could happen. There is a path and it's gradual. Wherever we are on the path, we, we continue on the path because it helps us to feel happy and well. Creative, we're inspired by the life of the Buddha and other teachers that have walked the talk and walked the path like Sangharachita, Thich Nhat Hanh, the Dalai Lama, whoever else. So he also said, so he said the path of the Dharma is gradual. The spiritual path is gradual. The training is gradual. It's a path of regular steps. And one of the points he makes is the spiritual. So he makes the path, that makes the point that the ocean, all of the rivers are running into the ocean. And when they meet the ocean, they lose their names. There's just the great ocean. And the spiritual path requires a commitment. You know, some come part of the spiritual community, lose their names, like myself and Muji Muni, who have joined this order. Others are interested in, 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 in being friends, coming along to classes, going on retreat, whatever. Wherever we're at, there's no have to do in this, in, this, in this practice, in this life, this spiritual path of the Buddha. We do whatever we feel we need or want or are inspired to do. So for us, we joined the order and committed to the teachings of the Buddha. So whatever our commitment, whether it's committing to the longer haul of the path of the Buddha or just committing to coming on a course or whatever we're doing in our life, if it's going to bring development for our whole being, we have to do it wholeheartedly. 
engage, make a commitment. So for this particular course, course, The Taste of Freedom, the commitment is make a commitment to the six week course, a practice. It gives an inspiration and then see, where, see what happens. So, so there's ways of doing all of this, but commitment and dedication are key. That's the Buddha's teachings. So the inspiration of enlightenment, being free, free of looking at phenomena, things in a way of wanting or turning away is over for the Buddha because he's transcended that kind of way. There is only now beautiful compassion and clear seeing and wisdom. Hard to describe, but the inspiration from the taste of freedom, that image of the, of the ocean, the great ocean having the taste of salt shows the enormity because the ocean is huge, isn't it? Rivers run into it, has no boundaries. Of course, we talk about climate change, that's another thing. But So whatever mysterious and wonder that the ocean can bring up for us, it is nothing like the mysterious wonder that I feel about the Buddha and what, how he transforms into the transcendental. It's a mystery and it's magical, although there is a path to get there. And I think we need the wonder and inspiration and magic to follow the path of the Buddha. So as we follow the path of the Buddha, we are open to all the different teachings. And the teaching of the perfection of wisdom, the Heart Sutra, I find very inspiring, mysterious and inspiring. The image in this Heart Sutra is of Pranya Paramata, the Buddha of transcendental wisdom. In this raft, ferrying people across to the other shore, across this water. And it's an image of what enlightenment might be. And in the Sanskrit uh, words, it's gate, gate, paragate, parasangate, bodhiswaha. Translated, gone, gone, gone beyond. Because there's only been one Buddha. So we don't know exactly what that's like until we are Buddha, but we can have the experience of the path. And one of the really important teaching of the Buddha was, these are my teachings. 
ethics, meditation, wisdom, four noble truths. Practice. Don't take my word for it. Don't take anybody's word for it. Through your own experience, see if it works for you. And that's why I'm a Buddhist, because it works for me. There's one last point I'd like to make about nature and the Buddha. Because when we look back, we'd say 2,005 years ago, he lived at a different time. We live in a time, maybe it's more materialism, where he lived in nature, trees, walked in nature, oral tradition. Nothing was written down until a thousand years after he was gone. So, but, but, but what is the same is outside nature. We do have trees. We do have rivers and lakes and the ocean. We do, we can connect with the Buddha through nature. That's my experience. Or have some sort of understanding of presence and mindfulness through sitting with plants or walking by the sea. Uh, today I, wa I watched a whole group of birds weaving and dancing in the sky over the ocean just for about a few minutes and then they were gone it was like oh and there was like a moment of light and then glistening diamonds in the sky and it was over but it was beautiful and magical and mysterious and i suppose it opens up a door to see in a different way and we have that access by just walking out our doors no matter if we're in a city or in the country, we can find a way to access nature and open up these delights. So to move on from this now, um, what's your own taste of freedom? What for you are you searching for? Is freedom a word you connect with? It can be very evocative, you know, Martin Luther King, free at last, freedom in our own history, noble, struggle, painful, freedom in our own lives. We can be not free with jobs, relationships, family, whatever it is. And in the pandemic, our, our world has narrowed maybe. So if you reflect on that for a couple of minutes, and then we're going to just break into groups for maybe five minutes and to share whatever you feel about freedom. Maybe it's nothing at all. So um, Claire, Yep, I'm here. So, five, six minutes? Yep, can do that. Just get it set up now. Okay, I'm going to put everybody into the breakout rooms now. Breakout rooms now, thanks. <laughs> 